Welcome to Glyndebourne Encore. I'm Alexandra Coglin, Glyndebourne's Opera Specialist. 2022 sees Lab OM return to the Glyndebourne stage in the festival's first new production for over 20 years, a Bohem for and from a whole new generation. A young director, conductor and cast tell a story that's close to home, drawing on photography, cinema and mythology in a staging that won't look quite like any Bohem you've ever seen before. It has become a cliché of novels, television and films. A young group of friends share a tatty flat, living, playing and sleeping together in happy chaos. They may never know where their next meal is coming from, but the next party, the next kiss, are far more certain in lives lived as though each day was their last. But what happens when, for one of them, it really is the last day? When death forces its way into their lives, turning light-hearted comedy into unexpected tragedy? This is the sleight of hand that Puccini pulls off so devastatingly in La Boheme, the opera often described as a rom-com gone wrong. Both the score and the libretto paint their scene in a level of detail you'd normally expect from a film script. Whether it's a door opening or a candle blowing out, Puccini tells us when and how it happens. All of which makes for vivid drama, but action that, in the theatre, can often get predictable, stale. Floris Visser, the director of Glyndebourne's New Bohème, thinks that there's a different way to do things. Well, there's several traps, so to say, when you do Puccini. I think one of the traps is indeed the literalness that he, he describes in all his libretti. So that was one of the big red flags, so to say, that we as a team said to ourselves, we wanted to do something more profound. Our art form, theatre, art in general, of course, is also there to show the metaphysical side of things. The other red flag with Puccini is people call it often very sentimental. Big rallentandi, a lot of rubato and ritenuto, but that is not what is there in the score. You scrap all that away, then you actually see an extremely modern and fresh and contemporary composer. So when you scraped it right back to the bones of the score, all the kind of traditions of interpretation were away, what was your starting point? Where did you go from there? Everybody always focuses on Act 1 or 4 or Act 2 with the big Paris city. Look at Act 3, where they place it, because they place it in the back then, in the 1830s, in the outskirts of Paris, uh, close to what was then called the Barrière d'Enfer. And it's also the place um, that nowadays you can still go into the catacombs. The Barrière d'Enfer, the, 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 the border of hell doesn't exist anymore and we were intrigued by that because neither Puccini or the two writers of the libretto could have known that place because they stem from a time that Paris was already rebuilt. We had a very big gut feeling that what Puccini, Ilica and Giacosa were referring to had a much bigger symbolism. The other big thing for me was to escape the literalness, not to place it in the three different images. Normally, Act One is the studio of the boys. Then Act Two, we're on the streets with momos and the bars and the cafes of Paris. Act Three, then you see something of sometimes the gate of Paris or you see a lot of snow mostly. Then Act Four, we're back in the studio. And I always said to, them, to the team, I said, wouldn't it be fantastic if we can do it in one image, the entire show, but find an image where all these different acts can take place, but at the same time this image is also a more profound, symbolic and metaphysical uh, image. So me and Klaus went into the train from Amsterdam to Paris and started marching around the city. And I was constantly you know, having my camera with me, hoping to find this one image. We went into the catacombs. It is fascinating. You go down and the first thing you see is this big stone above. Arrête, c'est ici l'Empire de la Mort. Stop. This is the kingdom of death. Act three is where Mimi literally is on the border of hell. She has to choose. Um, to live with Rodolfo, she will die, but living without him is hell. Those scenes are on top of literally the gateway to hell, and it's lined with bones and skulls. It's fascinating. But I said to Klaus, we can't just put the entire opera in the catacombs of Paris. I mean, how are we going to <laughs> how are we going to celebrate Christmas Eve? And then I was actually ready to admit defeat, and I looked to my left. 
And I stop and I think and I look again and then I knew I had it. There was a huge iron gate between, between the houses. Um, it was a very narrow alley actually, only cobblestones with two sidewalks, two pavements on each side, perfectly symmetrical. And I saw people walk over it and just go up and disappear. I look up onto what the name of the street is, the, the street sign. It was called Passage d'Enfer, the passage to the underworld. And my heart stopped and I thought, this is it. We've got my one image. And I immediately had to think of a film we had already discussed, Meet Joe Black, where Brad Pitt famously plays death and comes amongst all of us, the people, and, and learns about love, life, and makes love for the first time, which is the most beautiful love scene I've ever seen. Because that ends also with him taking Anthony Hopkins, in that case, to the realm of death. And then they walk together away in the garden in that film, and they walk over a stone bridge, and you see them go up the bridge, and they disappear again. And this street had exactly that feeling. And in your production, we will literally see death as well, won't we? You're introducing him as a character. When I'm directing death, I have to say, just think often just, wow, fascinating. We're all so familiar with Paris through whether it's paintings or films or photographs. I know for you it's a very specific set of images that were the starting point for this production. Uh, will you show me? Yes, please. So it actually started first with this book called Paris Mon Amour. The photo it all started with was this by um, Sabine Weiss from 1953. For me it was fascinating. It was A, this entire black and white world, but also this young boy running away into that infinite light. Mm -hmm. I saw Rodolfo running after Mimi, who is just dissolved into paradise or the heavens or the afterlife. The fascinating thing is, it was all there in that one photo that I loved so much. If you go to that street now, it's the only street left in Paris from before Baron Haussmann, before this big turnover of Paris. So this is the only street left in Paris of the time of the book, where Mimi, Rodolfo, Musetta, Marcello could have really walked on. And I think another absolutely wonderful photo, which we've also really incorporated in the production, is this one by Brassai, which is called uh, Couple, Couple. And um, these chairs that you actually see are the chairs of which we, I think we've got 60 of them in the, in the production. And this was a very famous photo by uh, Dennis Stock. It's called uh, Café de, de Flore where you see the terrace furniture stuck up in big rows outside each bar and cafe. So I thought it wouldn't be wonderful to have an old wall with just the chairs of a cafe. And I always thought it wouldn't be wonderful that Act Two just starts with this huge choreography, this exciting choreo choreography of the chorus together with the waiters taking all these chairs off and building Momus on the streets as we know it. And also here you can see this couple making love there, kissing. This is more Musetta and Marcello. And that was also the moment that I knew it needed to become a very monochrome, black and white show. That the set needed to be black and white, that the costumes needed to be black and white, but then only as an element that sometimes is more profound or symbolic, that we would introduce the color red or the color pink. It's, it's a little bit like uh, Schindler's List from Spielberg. It's a black and white film, but you only have that girl there in the pink, reddish coat coming through. So it's this wonderful black and white world that played a huge role in my thinking but also in us designing as a team the entire, for, for the entire production. And it's interesting, common to all of these photos, these aren't spaces that anyone owns, are they? No. They are more than just a person in a space. They all become symbols and metaphors. And that is the way I think you need to attack Puccini because he's not only literal, he is a huge admirer of Wagner. They go into poetry um, um, and the metaphysical idea of what love is. Um, it's the same of all the, the music in Act 3. There is not a text or not a melody that doesn't go to the core of what human beings and life are about. Um, and I think that people often forget. 
we, we see it as a film script yeah. and we don't see it as a much bigger, richer work of art. Puccini's doomed romance between a passionate, idealistic boy and the girl next door feels very familiar to all of us raised on big screen Hollywood dramas. A musical cousin to Brief Encounter, Love Story or The Notebook. But for the composer's own audience, it represented something new and shocking. Comedy was one thing, but when it came to tragedy, the opera house was home to kings and queens, knights, generals and sorceresses. What could a seamstress and her struggling poet lover possibly have to say to one another in this elaborate musical language? The answer, it turns out, is plenty. In La Boheme, he created a new operatic language. This is a tragedy that doesn't know it's a tragedy, whose characters chat and tease and stumble down the stairs, fight and flirt as casually as any people going about their daily lives. Real life, but more so, where repartee is quicker, love more intense, and loss overwhelming. Floris Visser directs a bold metaphysical take on the opera, a staging that moves beyond the literal, exploring the darker themes and ideas that stir beneath the romantic surface. Jordan D'Souza conducts an exciting international cast, including Long Long and Yaritza Veliz as Rodolfo and Mimi, with Vuvum Pofu as Musetta. <laughs> 